Uh, well, it's a, a particular joy this morning to welcome Professor Ben Quash as our final keynote speaker. Uh, he and I have been good friends ever since we were both pastoral assistants together in the Diocese of Johannesburg in South Africa in the early 1990s. Um, ben is Professor of Christianity and the Arts at King's College London, and he was formerly Dean of Peterhouse at Cambridge University. Uh, he's written a variety of books and articles, including Abiding, which was the Archbishop of Canterbury's Lent book in 2013, and Found Theology, a more systematic work, but one which characteristically ranges widely over literary and cultural terrain. Um, in all of his writing, Ben is concerned to identify the particular nature of Anglican identity. Uh, he doesn't do that in an exclusive way, since actually the majority of res his research has been on non-Anglican theologians. Uh, however, I think one thing that's important uh, for a conference like this is just to note that he's always keen to explore what are the particular gifts that the Anglican tradition and Anglican church life have to offer Christianity more widely. Um, ben is currently spearheading a project which he'll tell us more about, um, which, but one that I think will be very significant for all the churches, uh, an online visual commentary on each book of the Bible which will draw on theology, biblical scholarship and art history, which uh, when it's completed I think will give an amazing resource for all of us to preach and teach more clearly in ways that bear witness to the beauty of the God whom we encounter in the scriptures and in Jesus Christ. Um, in addition to his very full academic program, Ben is also very committed to the life of his local parish church in Fenditton, which is a village outside Cambridge where he lives. And so, like many of us here, he ministers regularly in a rural setting and has a, a deep understanding of that context. So we welcome him as our third keynote speaker on Called Into New Contexts, reading art, the Bible, and the world together. Well, thank you, Ed, for such a, a generous introduction, and thank you for inviting me. It's really lovely to be here. My granny lived in Chichester, like many people's grannies, I expect, um, and, uh, and both my great aunts. So it, it, was, uh, it was a place that I knew and loved very much as a child, and uh, I know we're not in Chichester now, but uh, it's nice to feel the connection through all of you. Does this work with the two microphones? I've got one here, but I'm going to move around a bit, but they're not competing with each other or making a horrible noise. Good. Well, it's not a very modest title, I'm afraid, for my talk. Um, what I'll offer you is rather more modest than the title promises. But I want to begin by thinking about, in line with the conference theme, about one particular moment of vocation, uh, that of um, the young boy Samuel in the Old Testament. Has anyone talked about that yet in any of the, the plenaries? Well, I, I find it a very interesting story of call because of the peculiar way in which Samuel doesn't recognize the voice as anything other, initially, as anything other than a human voice. What he hears is wholly explicable as, um, as just that, as a human voice, which is why he twice mistakes it for the voice uh, of Eli, the priest. Um, and yet the third time, something happens. And the difference, as, uh, as we're told in Scripture, the difference is that before that third time, Samuel, and I quote, did not yet know the Lord, and the word of the Lord had not yet been revealed to him. By the time of the third call, it had. So in some sense, he was, he was different. What, what, what he actually heard wasn't, but he was different. And this was the crucial thing that enabled him to discern uh, that he was being called by God. Um, he was, in other words, newly made, reconstituted, newly constituted as a uh, a servant of God, a recipient of God's word, a hearer of God. And it's in the light of that, the fact that, that what might be a call might not initially be recognisable as one, uh, it's in light of that I also wanted to show you this 
image, uh, Caravaggio's calling of St. Matthew, which uh, is still in a church setting, I'm pleased to say, in, in Rome. And this, too, is a, a very remarkable uh, exploration by the artist of how a divine call is not does not necessarily require you to put in lots of sort of very elaborate and very obvious signifiers of a divine presence. I mean, there are actually some rather subtle ones, and, of course, the presence of light uh, is a very ancient way of, of symbolizing the divine. But, but there's nothing intrinsically in the depiction of light that says you have to, you have to read this as God. Um, so th there needs to be a certain discernment beyond the natural sign that it is, to see it as a divine sign. Um, and what we have here is actually a very ordinary scene set in the time of Car Caravaggio, and uh, it's a rather grubby uh, little room with a, uh, an oilskin-covered window set high up in the wall, and with a group of people in early 17th century costume gathered around a table counting money. Matthew is one of those people. We don't actually, there's some scholarly debate about which he is, but that, we don't need to concern ourselves with, with that here. And then on the right of the painting, we see Jesus uh, and Simon Peter standing right in front of him uh, with Jesus' arm outstretched, but in the shadow below the ray of light. And um, he, too, is partially obscured by Peter. So we have what's a very typical, characteristic Caravaggio-type effect, which is to make us have to work very hard to see where, where Jesus is, in this case, in the picture, but by extension where div the divine action of the calling is. It's not immediately made obvious. We're not seeing here anything other than we might see in the ordinary world about us. He hasn't added angels or clouds bursting open in the top part of the painting. Nothing that, as it were, proclaims the divine presence. What we have instead are the things we would recognize, or at least an early 17th century viewer would recognize in their own environment. And the work of discernment involves a change in us, partly a receptivity to something beyond what's immediately uh, obvious in these material presences in the world. The material facts of the world that are looked on by believers are not actually different from those material facts of the world that are looked on by unbelievers. We all see the same things. The point is we see them differently. We see perhaps more in them. Now, there's lots more we could say about this wonderful painting, and maybe we can come back to it in the questions. I gather that Ian Paul talked about fingers a bit in relation to Michelangelo's uh, creation of Adam on the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel. Th there's one interesting piece of sort of art historical trivia, which is theologically very interesting about this painting, which is that uh, Caravaggio is, is echoing one of the hands of, of, that, of that ceiling do you know which? It's the hand of God, but it's in, as it were, the position... Sorry, it's the hand of... I beg your pardon. It's the hand of Adam, I think, but in the position of the hand of God. I think I'm right. In any case, what he's doing there is, again, without, as it were, proclaiming it or giving us some sort of very heavy-handed, obvious description, he's very subtly, if you're lucky enough to know Michelangelo's ceiling, as Caravaggio did, that this, this figure even though he's half hidden in shadow, is both God and human. This is the divine and human natures signaled by that one painted hand. It's a brilliant piece of, the uh, of artistic explication of the doctrine of the two natures of Christ. And this is why the calling of Matthew is not just a human calling, it's a divine calling. It is like the calling of Samuel, a new creation, the reconstitution of a, of a person to receive God's word and live uh, in a new way. So that's, um, that's where I want to start, with that, that curious fact that call doesn't necessarily proclaim itself and that all of us are seeing the same and hearing the same sorts of things in the world. So the challenge and perhaps the gift of believers uh, to those around them is to encourage a seeing of more, a seeing of more in what we all together see. And the nature of that moreness is one of the key things I want to explore in, in this session um, in terms of widening context, if you like. I'll explain that a bit more as we go on. Um, but that word more um, puts me in mind of another biblical text, this time from the New Testament, 
Uh, and that's Jesus' words in chapter 11 of Matthew's Gospel, where he's talking about John the Baptist and John the Baptist preaching in the wilderness. And he asks his hearers, what did you go out into the wilderness to see? In this case, we're talking about seeing, not hearing. What did you go out into the wilderness to see? A reed shaken by the wind? No. Emperor, uh, king in fine clothing? No. A prophet? Yes. But more, more than a prophet. But this repeated question, what did you go out to see, seems to be provoking Jesus' hearers to, to, as it were, travel with him on a journey through the dismissal of various things they, they hadn't seen towards not just what they had seen, but seeing more in what they had seen. Not just a prophet, but more than a prophet. What that more is, is of course something we can uh, think about and that artists have thought about in all kinds of ways as they've depicted John the Baptist in art. He's one of the most interesting saints in art, I think, uh, because he's depicted in so many different ways and at so many different stages of his life. But the moreness of John is something also about the particular divine calling that he has. And that isn't immediately obvious necessarily on first sighting. The call to see more. Um, and you might say that part of the gift of, of visual artists to us is to also to encourage us to see more in the things around us. So particularly artists who still work in a more figurative tradition, they show us things that we know. Um, you could go and actually look at some sunflowers in a vase if you wanted to, rather than go to the National Gallery and stand in front of Van Gogh's sunflowers. Uh, it's not, therefore, that we need Van Gogh to paint sunflowers in order to see what sunflowers look like. The particular way in which Van Gogh uh, explores the essence or the, the qualities of those and communicates them, as it were, as, as a result of the particular chemistry that's gone on between them and him, becomes, as it were, an expansion of what those sunflowers are. I mean, a moreness about those sunflowers is added to them or elicited from them by, uh, by the artist and then shared with us. So you, you might say that there's an example of the way that artists bring out the moreness in, in things and share it with those who view their work. So that, that trope of summoning us to see more is one you might say is shared between artists, some artists at any rate, and, um, and those who, <coughs> Jesus himself, and those who, in following Jesus, call people uh, to attend to God's word and God's activity in the world, to see more. And another little piece of trivia, it's interesting that Jesus actually uses two different words for to see in that short passage. Um, and while they have overlapping meanings, the first one in Greek suggests more, of, and the one he uses first, suggests more of a kind of distanced looking, the kind of seeing of an, of an onlooker, um, a spectator at some kind of public show, the surveyor of a scene, or the admirer of some great person's appearance. You know, they all have this sense of a sort of distanced looking, whereas the second sort of seeing implies something more like perception and discernment and um, the turning not only of the eyes but the mind to something. So Jesus' language in this passage is also pushing us on a sort of journey, um, moving us on, if you like, from uh, distant seeing towards a better and more engrossed kind of seeing, perhaps more like the seeing of artists. So today I'm thinking with you, I hope, about our call to see more uh, and to see around us not just stuff, not just objects, but gifts, things with a divine depth to them, things uh, whose source is in God and whose goal or end is in God, things as bestowals by God to us and to those around us. Signs of God, because each thing, even the most mundane and ordinary thing, each thing in its deepest truth is to be understood as pointing to its source and goal, as having its origin and end in God, by its very being at all. And to see even the most everyday objects in that way is to see more in them, because we allow ourselves to experience things in their fullest possible context, and that is if you like, the divine context. 
the context in which all contexts are held. The God who creates all things and sustains them is the, is the God who creates the contexts in which things are both produced and received, and that pushing, pushing outwards towards the fullest kind of moreness is something that I think the Christian life summons us to, to do. And, of course, we can never be adequate to it, um, but it's an adventure that, that is never-ending, and I guess you might say goes on beyond the end of this life. Uh, I love the way that C.S. Lewis describes the further up and further in of the final book in the Narnia series, The, the Last Battle. That sense that, there is a, that eternity in its perfection is precisely a never-ending pressing forward to discover even wider and deeper aspects of God's um, of abund abundant and creative love. Now for a bugbear of mine. I'm going to complain about uh, academic disciplines with which I have to do in the university, and I'm, I'm going to celebrate the superiority of theology. Um, it's easy to get this kind of thing off my chest with audiences like this. It's much harder to do it in the university. Um, but it's a particularly acute issue for me because of the visual commentary on scripture that Edward mentioned, and which I'll speak about more later, because it does involve this interdisciplinary conversation between theology and biblical studies and art history. Um, and what I find, is, to my surprise somewhat, is that there is a lot more in common between biblical studies and art history than either of them has with theology. <laughs> Let's think about that for a minute. Now, why might that be? Well, to put it sharply, and probably a little bit unfairly, there is a widespread methodological atheism in both a lot of biblical studies and certainly in art history, both of them proclaiming a certain kind of allegedly scientific approach to their respective bodies of material. Uh, using texts for a moment to cover both scriptural examples and cases from the visual arts, um, we may say that texts in original context supposing such context to be reconstructable, which both disciplines usually do, that texts in original context are given the dignity of being meaning-intensive, but subsequent contexts, the context in which such texts, and I mean again art and biblical texts, uh, are then received and used over time, are treated as more or less arbitrary. Or rather, the productive things that happen when a text interacts with successive new contexts is not regard the, uh, those productive things are not regarded as having any particular sort of meantness. Indeed, they cannot, in the terms available to the historical critical method and the art historical method, which is very similar, they cannot be regarded in this way. Because to regard later contexts as in some way meant would require something like a theological affirmation that historical process unfolds in non-arbitrary ways, even if the particular directions it takes are not regularly clear to our interpretative gaze. Very few historians since Herbert Butterfield in the early 20th century have dared to suggest that the historian's tools should be used to support a theory of providence, or fate even. Uh, that's something that historians have now systematically tended to turn away from. So the effect is that such theories theories about fate or providence, are bracketed and set aside as not belonging to the realm of responsible scholarship. Interpretations of texts, then, manifest something a bit more like a sort of Darwinian process of natural selection, in which certain fit interpretations are consistent in advancing themselves, but the motor of this selective process is a series of random mutations in the context of reading, or in the case of art, of viewing it. And the implicit message in the method is that the ways that texts are put to work over time in the form of new interpretations which result in new human outcomes are likely to be projections or impositions onto the text which are, by the same token, not true or truthful to it. So I hope that makes some kind of sense. So you might say that, that there's a great investment, therefore, in the truth and the meaning of the of the original, the text in its original context, but a deep suspicion of, of later re-readings, re-interpretations, re-adaptations of texts and artworks over time. <laughs> 
The reason that Christian theology, I think, should be prepared to defend this second part, this receiving dynamic of receiving in new contexts over time, is precisely because of the doctrine of the Holy Spirit, the, the pneumatological insistence that God is at work not only in the initial um, uh, announcement of the good news in Jesus during the incarnate life of Jesus and in his death, resurrection and ascension, but is still active in creating the church and the, uh, those contexts we may not easily discern outside the visible walls of the church, in creating those contexts in which that good news is still active and received and transforming the world towards its full eschatological consummation. If you don't believe that God is active in that way, you have a deficient doctrine of the Trinity. You have a deficient doctrine of how God is at work, not only in the initial delivery of the good news, but in the ongoing creation of hearers for it. The constitution of hearers, and I hope you hear the echo there of Samuel and Matthew, the new creation of hearers for this word. And it doesn't require that they will all hear in exactly the same way as everyone else who God constitutes because God is not necessarily restricted uh, in that way. There's no, way, there's no ne necessity uh, for God to have to make texts mean only one thing. God makes the abundance, if you like, of the text um, in making an abundance of hearers and receivers of that text. So Christian pneumatology gives grounds for affirming that the God by whom the church's scriptural texts are inspired also creates the world a single world we all share, in which all the contexts for the interpretation of those scriptural texts exist. The contexts in which, over time, the revelatory texts of Christianity continue to be read are all part of God's creation, which is, as a whole, being drawn, as I say, towards eschatological fulfillment by the Spirit. And an account of divine action which concluded that God in Christ acted just once in a short period of self-disclosure recorded in the Gospels and then le left history meandering on its way unpredictably, leaving human beings the challenge of guarding the pure truth of the original testimony in the face of endless happenstance would be an underdeveloped account of God. John's Gospel in particular witnesses to the promise of the Holy Spirit who will continue to lead into all truth. The Spirit is the unfolder of the full meanings of the revealed texts, and the doctrinal affirmation of the triunity of the Godhead requires the claim that the God who makes himself known in Christ is the same God who inspires and sustains a community that continually lives from and rereads and reinterprets the texts that witness to Christ. Well, that's to get a certain amount uh, off my chest, and, um, and just a sort of uh, visual illustration of uh, just how differently one might respond to the sorts of things that biblical texts are, and in particular here, the gospel texts. Uh, I'm showing you this, the, the ceiling of the Basilica of uh, San Marco in Venice, in which Christ is disclosed in the centre of the dome um, amongst uh, a heavenly array of figures. But the thing that I really want you to pay attention to here are the, uh, the figures on the four pendentives. Those are those sort of slightly triangular shapes that, that connect the dome to the four great pillars that then connect the dome to the floor. Um, or who are those four figures? The evangelists. Yeah, the four evangelists. So there, there you have this, uh, this creation. of it's, it's a form of what's often called the tetramorph. Um, those of you who know Coventry Cathedral will recognise that Sutherland, Graham Sutherland incorporates the tetramorph uh, in his great uh, tapestry of Christ enthroned in glory. There they are, like the, the wheels of Ezekiel's chariot on which God is enthroned, um, which is where the figures are derived from. The, f the four figures of the tetramorph frame uh, this figure of Christ in glory in Sutherland's tapestry, and there they are uh, on the pendentives in Venice, and very commonly elsewhere in uh, Orthodox churches, you'll find the evangelists there. And that's interesting because this is a, a wholly different way of thinking about what the Gospels are, which is not principally concerned with, for example, uh, which came first, 
or whether one is derived from the other, from another, what, how much each of them shares, and so on. There's rather a, an initial sense that what they do together is to create a shared space, a shared habitable space, in which people can move around and worship and to, uh, to some extent live. If you think of the, the four square space below as symbolizing earth as a whole and the dome as heaven, then that space beneath the dome is, if you like, representative of the whole of earth. So the, the gospels taken together represent a living space, uh, an acting area in which our lives can flourish and we, we, we as it were, are encouraged to be um, more fully ourselves in relation to one another and in relation to Christ who presides over this whole <coughs> sphere of life and activity. That's a, a, that, for me, is a far more truthful, in ecclesiastical terms, in uh, pneumatological terms, a far more truthful way of thinking about the sorts of things the gospel is, which simply doesn't feature in most of the language of uh, historical criticism. Um, and some, I've heard some uh, of my biblical studies colleagues, when they think about this kind of thing, and you might also think of liturgical uh, correlates to this, where a particular liturgical event actually involves the interaction of scriptural texts pulled from all the different Gospels, the seven last words from the cross, for example. Uh, the, the words, none of those seven utterances of Christ from the cross appears in one Gospel. The bringing them together, I've heard kind of disparaged by biblical scholars, even quite devout ones, because it's a, it's a synthesis, and we don't like Syntheses, it does it where it reduces the particularity and difference of the Gospels as historical documents. Well, actually, it doesn't have to be seen in that sort of way as a reductive kind of synthesis at all. Um, rather, it can be seen as an exploration of, uh, the, uh, of the way in which they're one another's context, in which they provide a context for each other. Um, they combine with and modulate one another. They draw out aspects. Each one can draw out aspects of the others, supplement it, complement it, sometimes set up tensions with one another. This is not harmonizing them in the sense of reducing them to some kind of monologue. All of these dynamics have the effect of constituting those who dwell in the space between them as agents negotiating the space that the Gospels co-create and relating this space to the biggest context of all the all-encompassing context of creation, salvation, and eschatological fulfillment, which I've been calling the divine context. So let's celebrate that. I think it's, um, it's wonderful to be allowed to do that. Now, to, to drive home the, the importance of attending to not just what is heard, but who hears, I thought we'd do a little <coughs> exercise at this point. So without telling you where this comes from, some of you, of course, will, most of you probably will immediately recognize it, but uh, I'm showing you these words, which are from the Bible, somewhere. Let the wicked person not trust in emptiness, deceiving himself, for emptiness will be his recompense. It will be paid in full before his time, and his branch will not be green. He will shake off his unripe grape like the vine, and cast off his blossom like the olive tree. For the company of the godless is barren, and fire consumes the tents of bribery. They conceive mischief and bring forth evil, and their heart prepares deceit. Goes on, agree with God and be at peace. Thereby good will come to you. We've heard all the bad things that are going to happen to the, those wicked people. Uh, thereby good will come to you. Receive instruction from his mouth and lay up his words in your heart. If you return to the Almighty and humble yourself, if you remove unrighteousness far from your tents, if you lay gold in the dust and gold of Ophir among the stones of the torrent bed, and if the Almighty is your gold and your precious silver, then you will delight yourself in the Lord and lift up your face to God. You will make your prayer to him and he will hear you and you will pay your vows. You will decide on a matter and it will be established for you and light will shine on your ways. For God abases the proud, but he saves the lowly. Well, that very last verse, of course, sounds like a sort of pre prelude to the Magnificat in a certain way. Well, marvellous words about God's uh, concern to raise up the good and to judge the wicked. They come from, anyone? Job. Job, chapter 15, from the mouths of the comforters to Job, of Job, the tempted comforters of Job, the unsuccessful comforters of Job. And as you will all know, a little bit later in the book of Job, God replies, 
My wrath is kindled against you. To them, who've just uttered this, my wrath is kindled against you and against your two friends, for you have not spoken of me what is right. Now, this, this I think, is as good an illustration of any of how important it is to recognize context for particular sets of biblical uh, words. Um, the context makes all the difference in the case of those utterances. It's not that the words are wrong. There's nothing actually in those words that is wrong. They're wrong in the context in which they're uttered. They have mistaken the nature of Job's need and suffering, and they speak, therefore, pastorally wrongly to it, which makes the words not what is right in God's repost. Um, it, and to understand that, you need not only to understand, as it were, the human context or the pastoral context of their utterance. That's part of uh, what you do need to understand, but not the only thing. You have to understand the, the textual context, as it were, their place within the larger book of Job. And only then will you understand why they're wrong. Because in terms of, as I say, their, their intrinsic subject matter, they're very, very little different from, say, Psalm 1, which has exactly this structure of, first of all, saying what the destiny of the wicked will be, and, uh, sorry, first of all, in this case, what the destiny of the good will be, the reward of the good, and then the destiny of the wicked. But even Psalm 1, as we know, has had a, a huge range of uh, different interpretations because of the different context in which it's been received. And while uh, the words of Job's comforters are clearly, because divinely, uh, to be denounced, um, here we have a more difficult problem because the multiple ways in which this psalm has been interpreted and received through the history of Christianity um, set, set up some interesting tensions. So, for example, and I mean actually not just Christianity, Judaism and Christianity. This is part of our shared scriptural heritage. So, whereas uh, a Jew reading this might first of all and most naturally see this as uh, an account of the difference between observing Torah and not observing Torah, um, the way in which uh, Christians tend habitually to read it is first of all to see it, and I've done this with, with classes of uh, students uh, at King's, I just get them to read and say, who do you think the wicked are and who do you think the good are? And in a majority of cases, the first thing they say if they're practicing Christians was, well, the, the, uh, the wicked are, the, are, are, pe are people who don't follow Jesus. They're unbelievers. Um, and uh, so the implication being, we're, we're the good. Um, in fact, I think that's, um, that's one of the real <coughs> tripping wires in relation to this. Uh, psalm. And this is where pushing to read it against the background of other readings in other historical contexts is a very important way of putting a question mark against what might be our most natural or instinctive reading. Uh, if we look, for example, at St. Augustine and the way he reads this, he, uh, he insists that the man in the first verse can only mean Jesus, can only mean Christ, because only one man is sinless. Only one human being is sinless. Only one human being walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners. Uh, in part, this is because of Augustine's fairly uh, um, developed sense, shall we say, of, of original sin. Um, so it can only mean Christ. Um, and that means all of us are the wicked. So suddenly, what might have, as it were, been rather a comforting uh, psalm to those of us who like to think we're on the, side of, on the right side in this particular game, find ourselves all placed on the other side, which, of course, is the, precisely the prelude to the need to acknowledgement of the need for redemption and so on. Um, then we find very disturbing readings of this psalm. For example, Martin Luther, who reads the wicked very specifically as the Jews, um, pointing to this image of chaff being blown away and saying, we, we can clearly see the evidence of history points to the fact through the Jewish diaspora that this is what has happened to the Jews, so it must mean them which is an odd way then to go to reverse Augustine's instinct and put a very, very particular group in the category of the wicked and restore us Christians to the safe side of the divide. So you can see just how much difference a context makes and how, how demanding, importantly demanding, that both the process of discerning a good and a bad context are, a good and a bad reading. But it doesn't require you to flatten them all out. Um, and so I'm going to give you some visual examples of what we, we might think of as, again, a display of how one biblical text can find multiple interpretations in art, in this case, rather than in written theology. Um, and then, well, I'll ask you then what, what, whether you think that this multiplicity is a, a regrettable thing, and really it would be better just to have one visual image of uh, 
Abraham and Isaac and the sacrifice on Mount Moriah, or whether there's something enriching about the multiplicity of these interpretations. So here we have uh, the exterior of Chartres Cathedral, um, and Abraham and Isaac here contextualized, again, this, the importance of context, but in a slightly different way, uh, artistically, because of who they're amongst. So here they're contextualized um, um, in a series of patriarchs around one of the great doors into Chartres Cathedral. Um, and on the immediate left, as we look at it, of Abraham and Isaac, we have Melchizedek. Although the angel that's coming to stay, Abraham's hand, is appearing just above Melchizedek's head, and Abraham and Isaac both looking up towards it. I'm afraid I can't remember the, the uh, patriarch on the other side of Abraham. But in any case, this is saying that one important way to read Abraham and Isaac is in the series of, in the great sort of series of uh, Old Testament figures who are part of salvation history. It's a contextualization in Old Testament salvation history. And then in the wider architectural decorative scheme of Chartres, of course, not just Old Testament uh, salvation history, but the whole of salvation history. Here we have possibly one of the very earliest examples of Jewish figurative art from the now deserted town of Dura Europus in Syria. And this is a detail from the decorative scheme around the Torah niche in the, in the synagogue there from the, from the fourth century or the early fifth century. Um, and again, it's Abraham uh, standing with his back to us, very unusually, and Isaac on top of that rather elaborate altar. And then a very peculiar thing in the far, you see the hand of God above Isaac, and then in the very far upper right, you can see something very peculiar, which might be a tent, um, and, a, and a small figure standing in the mouth of the tent, which, uh, again, there's been much speculation about. Uh, some people think it's, it's actually a mountain, and that it's showing um, a, a buried figure, symbolizing Isaac, although he wasn't actually killed, but, um, but his sort of going through death. Uh, but I think much more plausibly it's been read as Sarah standing in the mouth of the tent. Um, she's described as in that position earlier on when the, the promise is given to them that they will have a son. Um, and uh, it's as though she's awaiting on the far side of this event, awaiting still in the tent um, the return of Abraham and Isaac. In any case, um, what we have here is a contextualization that isn't only narrative, but if you look at the wider scheme, there, there's a whole series of incredible uh, frescoes in Jury Ropus, um, uh, but also in the particular context of the Torah niche, uh, as you can see there in the top of it, Abraham and Isaac on the right, but then a symbol in the middle of the eschatological temple, the restored temple of the future, the, the kind of equivalent of what the book of Revelation celebrates as the new Jerusalem. So here a very definite Jewish contextualization of the sacrifice on Mount Moriah in, uh, in conjunction with the economy of sacrifice in the earthly temple that will come after Abraham and that will be finally fulfilled in the heavenly temple. So that's, as it were, a Jewish contextualization of the event in, uh, in Genesis that reads it as part of a Jewish eschatology. There it is again. And then here in a, in a book of hours, we have uh, a different kind of contextualization, the kind of typological contextualization that's so typical of uh, much, uh, certainly, medieval Christian art, in which the, the uh, figure of Isaac carrying the bundle of wood for the fire in the bottom right is directly parallel to the figure of Christ carrying the cross. And of course, that's already a biblical parallel, as we know, because Isaac and Christ are compared. But here we see it brought out visually. And this, this is another contextualization, you might say, a typological contextualization of the story, uh, rather than simply a historical one or an eschatological one um, or a textual one. And then this, again, I, you can tell I love Caravaggio, this astonishing uh, image of the sacrifice of Isaac, the near sacrifice of Isaac, um, which brings a completely different dimension to it. It's indebted, incidentally, to uh, the, one of the two um, entries for the commission to make the great bronze doors in, uh, of the baptistry in Florence uh, in the early um, Quattrocento in the early 1400s. Um, uh, the one on the left, which I think is Brunelleschi's one, the one that didn't win, actually. Um, but Brunelleschi, as you can just about see, I think, um, has is Abraham placing a thumb violently up against the chin of Isaac. This is a very innovative move by the artist. Uh, that other artists would have been aware of. 
And, uh, and I think part of what that shows is something that, that characterizes that period, that, if you like, that period of artistic experimentation. Uh, the exploration in, far, in a far more insistent and determined way, the exploration of the inner worlds of human emotion that might be there in biblical stories, although they're not explicitly brought out in the way those stories are told. You don't get any emotion in the way that Genesis tells the story of Abraham and Isaac. But in this period, there's a huge interest in how uh, art can, as it were, draw out what is unspoken or unsaid in the biblical text um, and explore those inner worlds. And it's something that you can also see in literature of the period where some of the great kind of classical tragedies that, that are often rather sort of emotionless um, or presented in very formal and stylized ways become in the hands of someone like Shakespeare, who's a near contemporary of Caravaggio, uh, much greater explorations of the inner emotional, psychological worlds of the characters. Well, you're seeing something like this in the way that uh, Genesis's account becomes um, taken up and explored by Brunelleschi and uh, Caravaggio. There's his particular uh, adaptation of this violent thumb. Now, the question is that whether that fascination with human emotion and psychological trauma, you might say, uh, because it's a very traumatic image, that, um, is a, a, in its own way a form of faithfulness to the biblical text. It doesn't seem to be what Genesis 15 is most concerned with. Um, but in any case, what it is doing is introducing a new context for the reading of Genesis 15. Uh, and that new context is a new appreciation of the worlds of, uh, the worlds of human uh, psychology, um, in this case also relationship, the violence of human relationships, and so on. Does that add something? Does that add something to our reading of the text, to bring that into our reading of the text? Is something new added? Well, I want to suggest that uh, I think the world would be a poorer place if we didn't have all of those different sorts of images that I just showed you, because they all provide a context for me and us to read the text with. And even if we don't necessarily want to read it as Caravaggio did, uh, and we probably might find it quite difficult to preach that text in the way that he's displayed, you know, in, in, in the spirit in which he's exploring it here visually, <laughs> nevertheless, having it there is something that uh, uh, enhances the, my context of reading as I read that text. What about you? Well, maybe save it for the, um, for the question time. I'd like, you to, I'd like to hear what you think about that. So just a quick summary of some of the different contexts in which a particular biblical passage might be read. It's textual context, in other words, what went before and after it. What was in Genesis, what was in, you know, I hope I've got those, Genesis 18, isn't there? I've forgotten what, the, what chapter it is. Anyway, the chapters before and after it, the larger uh, arc of a particular biblical book, the larger arc of a particular, the canon of scripture, and that's actually going to be another one later. Then the context, the historical context of production, the kind of thing that historical critical scholars love to analyze, the three different contexts of the book of Isaiah, the production of the book of Isaiah, and so on, uh, finding out more about that through archaeology, through text scholarship, through philology. The historical context of reception, some of those things that the art has shown you, um, which show how a text has had an afterlife through time. The canonical context, in other words, the fact that it sits within what is regarded by Christians as, as a canon, and therefore has meaning not just in relation to what went immediately before and after it, but in relation to the whole canon of Scripture. And of course, that's true of Judaism too. And of course, different Christian traditions have quite different canons in some cases. Liturgical context, the seven last words again, that, that idea that certain texts might belong in, in a, a set of relationships that is not bound by necessarily by a particular place within scripture, but by the way in which the church over centuries has connected them up. So the three readings that a lectionary will give you for a Sunday morning or other case, significant occasions, those connections are very ancient connections. They, they, are, they are contexts for the interpretation of certain texts of the Bible that are uniquely the product of liturgical practice. And that's because it's believed that the, the, the juxtaposition of texts in this way is, is uh, a key to the truthful unlocking of some of the meaning of those texts. And in a way, it's very like the typological connection you get visually between Isaac going up the mountain and Jesus carrying the cross. Those sorts of connections are made liturgically as well. And then linguistic context. This is more typical of Judaism 
but where a particular word, for example, triggers a connection with another word, not even a sentence, but a word, a connection with another word somewhere else in Scripture. It might be the other end of Scripture altogether, but the fact that this word appears here and that word appears there stimulates particularly rabbinic commentators to want to explore what might be some kind of hidden divine intention behind the fact that these words appeared in two different places. And there are Christian equivalents to that, particularly in very early Christianity, but we won't go into those because I don't really know much about them. A last little comment from the wonderful Samuel Taylor Coleridge, one of the greatest Anglican theologians ever to have lived, if not the greatest. With respect, and this is about the human context in which we read, that we, we always read in human contexts. With respect to Christians generally, I object to the consequence drawn from the doctrine according to which every man that can but read is to sit down to the consecutive and connected perusal of the Bible under the expectation and assurance that the whole is within his comprehension and that unaided by note or comment, catechism or liturgical preparation, he is to find out for himself what he is bound to believe and practice, and that whatever he conscientiously understands by what he reads is to be his religion. This is one of the most eloquent defences of the value and importance of context, uh, I think, that you could have. And not just one type, but all of the types I've been listing, possibly. And the Bible is a very peculiar sort of text anyway, and this is the last thing I'm going to say before turning to the visual commentary in the last quarter of an hour or so. Um, the Bible bursts its own frame. Breaking the frame is something that you again see explored interestingly in visual ways. But, uh, and it has, it has all sorts of uh, equivalents in more modern visual media like film. Um, when I look at the last frame in this little cartoon strip, which is from the first, the first decade of, of the 20th century, about 19, 1905, um, that little boy who's called Lip Little Sammy Sneeze uh, looks out at us rather in the way that uh, Oliver Hardy does at frequent points in the Laurel and Hardy films. It's, uh, it's that sense of suddenly, as it were, departing from the particular uh, constraints of the narrative context and connecting out of the frame to us. He looks at us, as it were. This happens in paintings too. It's a trope that was used a lot in uh, House of Cards. C Kevin Spacey was constantly talking to camera as Frank Underwood, I uh, talking to us. And of course, it's something already there in Shakespearean uh, soliloquy. So the breaking of the frame uh, is a sort of a signaling that this, there is more to this story than just, as it were, what it seems to be in its own terms. Uh, the text, or the cartoon strip, or the film, is aware that you are watching. And it's, and it's there in the Bible when we hear the words, let the reader understand, for example. Who is the reader? Well, there's a sense that the Bible knows we're out there somewhere. It's sort of um, speaking beyond its particular narrative context. And it, it, we, there are interesting examples all over the Bible. It's got, got a technical term for it, which is called metaleptis. Um, and in its metaleptic, me metaleptic character, what the Bible is effectively doing is saying, I'm bigger than, I'm, I, you, I'm not one thing in the world you live in. You, are, you and your world are one thing in, in as it were, in the world that I'm describing. You're inside me. I'm not inside you. Does that make sense? And that's that, 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 again, that sense of pushing the divine context wider to encompass more, to see more, to hear more. Caravaggio breaks the frame in a similar sort of way by allowing that, that, the left arm of the disciple at the supper at Emmaus to come out almost, I mean, it's brilliant artistically, to come out of the space of the painting into our space. Uh, Albrecht Dürer creates an odd effect in this uh, little image of Christ on the cold stone, this kind of uh, pa passion-related image, uh, in that Christ's eyes don't look at us, but there's a peculiar way in which the two wounds on the feet of Christ become like eyes, I think, looking at us. So as he kind of folds into himself like a clenched fist, the image challenges us, engages our view, it confronts us, and says by, by that, I am not merely the object of your gaze. I'm not simply lying there under, under your control, under your visual control. You're actually being looked at by me. I'm, and, not, and because these are wounds that are looking at us, there's a challenge in that gaze that is profound and existential and disturbing. And that's, I think, what Dürer is aiming for. I'm looking at you. Who, who are you? What is your part in this story, and what are you going to do about it? So these are sort of metaleptic images in a certain way. 
that turn the gaze back onto us. Well, the visual commentary on scripture. Um, part of what we're doing, as Edward, as Edward indicated, is we're trying to create a resource that has both um, something very contemporary about it, because it's an online publication, and uh, so therefore it's, it's using modern technology. Um, and it's also harnessing a particular energy in contemporary life, which is uh, closely bound up with social media and the way we use it, which is the energy of sharing images, communicating through the sharing of images. This, I, I would suggest, is, a, is, a, a, is a, probably an unprecedented thing in, in our history, the sheer volume of images that are exchanged every day, um, and perhaps particularly by younger people. People uh, have discovered the way in which images are new a new sort of language, and it, they're speaking it at high speed um, and almost gabbling it. I mean, I, I worry sometimes at how, how quickly images are consumed and cast aside um, rather than dwelt with, but nevertheless, you sometimes have to work with the spirit of the age a bit. So we're, we're, we're trying to work with the spirit of the age in that respect, um, and also noting in that that there's a new ecumenicity about visual art that, that I think is unprecedented post-Reformation. So, of course, Orthodox and Catholic traditions have always had visual art. Um, but what's very interesting to me is that the more aniconic Protestant traditions um, are increasingly discovering that if they really want, as, as a mission imperative, if they really want to, sh to speak the gospel to all people in all languages, the visual has to be one of those languages. And so there's, as it were, a new engagement with visual art in worship and in mission across the churches, which I think is another kind of kairos moment, a great opportunity. So there's something very contemporary about making a visual commentary on scripture. Uh, there's also something very ancient about the way we're doing it, as I'll show you in a minute. But the kind of shortest summary of what we're trying to do is to gather a, a company of artists with whom to encounter the Bible. And um, of course, the, the sea of images is a daunting one to negotiate and to pluck from. Um, and the Bible is a very long series of books. So uh, the ambitious aim of the project is eventually to, to, to sort of divide the Bible up into passages of differing lengths, but to cover all of it. And we think about one and a half thousand will probably do it. That's partly by using the church's lectionary, which, in which we counted the number of times that uh, all the different passages of the Bible appear in the course of not only the, the, week, the um, Sunday lectionary, but the, the daily one as well, and it's actually just a little bit over one and a half thousand. So working on that premise, we're probably going to be able to cover most of it in passages of the sort of length you'd have as a lectionary reading uh, in one and a half thousand. But uh, in five years, that's still quite tight time-wise. Um, and the principle is, uh, and it's theologically based, so this is not just, as it were, an exercise in, uh, in and it's, this is not just a nice database of biblical art, which uh, says, you know, here's another image that, that shows Abraham and Isaac. It actually uh, involves quite careful selection of, of images and the eradication of all the other options, the selection of certain images on the grounds that they have something to say that's of theological interest when they're in conversation with the biblical text and with the other images that are chosen to go around it. So the model, if you like, is a bit like that of the Jewish Talmud, um, which is uh, to say there's a central text, and around it there are chosen, very carefully chosen, uh, sorry, it's one of these, I forgot this is one of those, um, suddenly becomes a PowerPoint that starts to change. I'm going to have to keep flicking back. This is going to be a little bit annoying. Um, but works of rabbis that are considered to be important enough to preserve on the page not because they all say the same thing, but because they dialogue interestingly and productively with each other as well as with the core text. Now, this is a Christian version of that. Um, it's something called the Katina. It's something that we very sadly lost in most, most forms of Christianity. Uh, and again, you can see in a slightly larger font in the middle, the biblical text. And then around it, passages from the church fathers, uh, uh, which are chosen because of their particular insight into uh, the, the biblical text and their particular um, capacity to fruitfully dialogue with each other around that biblical text. So one simple way of, of kind of explaining what we're doing with the visual commentary is that we're 
replacing those, that fat margin in which you've got uh, commentary, written commentary, with, um, with visual commentary. And um, does anybody know how to stop a PowerPoint going on automatically? I can never, I'll just keep pressing back. Um, uh, and that's, uh, I, that's a very, it doesn't mean there won't be any uh, written commentary, but it does mean that what will happen is that, it'll be a, that the curator, if you like, of the mini exhibitions around each scriptural text will, uh, will give an account, as a curator would in a museum or gallery setting, of why they've hung the particular, why they've chosen the works that they've chosen, why they've hung them in a particular way, and the kind of story that they want to tell as a consequence of that hang. Again, those of you who know the National Gallery in London might know Room 1, which is the room immediately on the left as you go up the main entrance staircase. And Room 1 is something that's used a lot for uh, small exhibitions. It's just got three walls, and then there's the, the wall with the door that you go in from. So you go into Room 1, and there are three walls. And very often, just a few things are hung on those. It might even just be three works of art, one on each wall. So in a sense, that sort of that simplicity, that discipline of... Um, of distillation, just down to three works, is a room one type of principle, but it also has these qualities of the rabbinic or the katina page. So we're asking the contributors to the visual commentary to be the curators of their particular biblical passage and to select just three works of art and then, like curators in a gallery, write labels, wall labels, that explain why they've chosen them and what they want to encourage people to see, to see the moreness that they want to see in that dialogue. Here, for example, you might see some of the contrasts that you, you would get if you treated John chapter 20, the meeting of Mary Magdalene with Jesus in the garden on the morning of the resurrection. And let's say a particular uh, contributor chose just th these three, there would be an implication in that threeness that there's so much more there, there could be. It would be, as it were, a stimulus to those who use the visual commentary to also think, well, what would I add? What would I, how would I curate that passage? What would I want to uh, add to it? As well as giving an example of how um, ver what variety they can be, even in just three. People have sometimes asked me, why three? Um, why not that many? Well, there's one answer, it's extremely expensive to buy image rights. Um, the second answer, which is you can't fit too much on a single web page. Uh, otherwise, you, you, like this, you can't really see anything. But there's a third thing, that, that three, in a way, it always implies more than three. So if you have two, you've got to sort of compare and contrast, spot the difference type of dynamic. The moment you have three, you have something that pushes you to imagine even more. And all of those uh, images are also images of Mary Magdalene and Jesus on that. They're all the same scriptural passage. So the three, as it were, implies more. And is cost effective, reasonably. What about something like the book of Joel and so many other parts of the Bible which don't have much of a visual history? This is a big challenge for us. Um, there is actually we found, to our amazement, an illustration from an 11th century Catalan manuscript of Joel chapter 1, and that's it. So that's okay, but that's about the only one we could find after a lot of hunting. Um, but one of the other key principles of the visual commentary is that you don't have to have only works of art that are directly related to the text, as it were, direct responses to the text. What, what's possible, and this is in, in a way to exemplify what I've been saying uh, earlier on, this is to trust that, that you can create new contexts by doing new things, by juxtaposing things that perhaps have never been brought together before, uh, and, and trust that those are things that uh, can be part of the work of the spirit in the present. Okay? So that's an image of a weeping mourner fr from uh, a tomb in France, from Dijon. Oh, it's now in a museum in Dijon. And when you look at that statue, alabaster statue, in conjunction with Joel, 113, uh, something really becomes alive in that text. Put on sackcloth and lament, sorry, you priests, wail, you ministers of the altar, come past the night in sackcloth, you ministers of my God. Grain offering and drink offering are withheld from the house of your God. The image brings the text to life in a very particular way, and I, I say to myself sometimes that a mark of success of the visual commentary will be when people, having visited one of the mini exhibitions, can never read the text in quite the same way again because in some way these images will already be part of the, the context of reading that, that is part of their visual imagination and their memory. Um, it will also work the other way and hopefully transform the way in which people look at the works of art, that the biblical text will come to mind. 
Um, and the third image in that particular mini exhibition is a 90, an image by a Latvian artist called Via Selmins, uh, made in 1970, which is a, a typical of her work, an extraordinarily detailed study of the arid surface of a desert just north of San Francisco in California, near where she lives. Uh, which, again, when you read that alongside Joel One's description of the aridity of the desert after divine judgment is upon it, uh, brings out in an almost a visceral way, affective way, um, what the words of the text are talking about. Uh, very quickly, another example might be the Transfiguration, uh, and again an example of how one might use works uh, that are about the text, or the text in this case, because they're synoptic parallels, but then something really remarkable happens, a sort of epiphany happens when you combine those two with a new image. Uh, this is a light installation uh, by Dan Flavin, um, which has the same sort of mandala-type shape as Christ is often shown in, in the context of uh, the Transfiguration. Um, and he didn't mean it to be in any way a response to a biblical text, although a lot of his early works he did call icons. Um, but the curator can do the creative work of creating that juxtaposition, and in doing that, reveal something about the potential of the work and of the text. Only if you trust that things mean more than they might once have meant. Things can mean more than they might once have meant. Okay, to go back to that very early theme. And of course, the other lovely thing about that Dan Flavin is that when you stand in front of it, you are bathed in its light. And that's what the disciples were experienced when they were on the mountain of the Transfiguration. Uh, it's only because we have a new artistic medium that that experience can be communicated. And that, again, brings something alive in the text that however brilliant, and they are brilliant, the works on either side by Theophanes the Greek and Fra Angelico may be, they can't in quite that way. So the particular combinations, the things that each of those three images bring, create a kind of new chemistry between each other and between them and the text. Well, I've slightly gone over time. Apologies for that. But I, I hope that gives you a little bit of a sense of what we're working on. We're going to launch on the 6th of November. So uh, as of tomorrow, we are just two months away. Um, and the aim is to have a, a hundred passages of scripture, which means 300 works of art. Uh, we may not quite get to 100, but um, it depends how much sleep I allow myself to have between now and then. But uh, when it does go live, you'll be able to visit it, and the address is there, thevcs.org. So uh, do make a note of that, thevcs.org. Uh, and although I think it's going to be of value to scholars, um, I deeply hope and expect that it will be something that will resource people in their ministries. Uh, whether it's just finding an image to put on the front of a, a service sheet on a particular Sunday, or generating resources that can be used uh, for study groups, uh, or helping to uh, give you ideas for your sermons, um, or things to illustrate them with. Um, part of the conception of this is that it's a resource for the church, as well as the academy, and importantly, as well as for art museums and galleries, to encourage them to have even more confidence uh, than they currently do in talking about why these works not only speak to us about the history of art, but of God. So thank you very much for listening. And, uh,